So my name is Melinda Overall and um, I'm here talking to you today about nutrition and immunity. Um, you will have noticed that that name of this, the talk is slightly different to that which um, Steph um, roped you in with, which was um, food and the immune system. The reason that I changed it um, as I prepared this talk was because nutrition in and of itself as a nutritionist, nutrition doesn't just focus on food. We think about a lot of other things uh, around lifestyle and other habits that we might get into. And so I wanted to incorporate some of that as well, um, not just look at, um, at food per se. So we'll talk about that. Um, hang on, here we go. This is where I've got to remember to click on the slide. So this is a little, little bit about me. So I'm a nutritionist and a counsellor. I'm also a lecturer in um, nutritional medicine at the Australasian College of Natural Therapies and Torrens University. Um, I'm a member of the Australian Traditional Medicine Society and the Australian Counselling Society um, and I work in private practice in Sydney's Inner West um, and part of one of the members of the um, Australasian Clinical Advisory Group for Polio in Australia. So that's a little bit about me and that's my new logo down the bottom so I'm quite pleased with that. Um, so this is a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be looking at the immune system. I'm going to give you a little brief overview of the immune system. I'm going to talk about that concept of whether or not we can or should boost the immune system. So this might challenge a few minds um, because I'm not entirely sure that we can or want to necessarily boost the immune system. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that and why um, having a super active immune system may not necessarily be helpful. I'm going to talk about um, the nutrients that we get from whole foods and how they support our immune system. Do a little bit of stuff around movement and lifestyle and you'll note that here I've called it movement not exercise because I know that some of you have, are more restricted in terms of what you can do um, than others. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about how movement itself can support our immune system doing its work. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, food choices and how we can simplify them because I think sometimes when people uh, think about nutrition, they think that suddenly they've got to empty everything out of their cupboards and everything out of their kitchen and start from scratch. And it really doesn't need to be like that. So my concept about talking around food is really to get you to think a little bit differently or the way that you might have thought about food for your entire lifetime and maybe think about some really simple changes that you might be able to, um, to make um, at home you know, with the support of um, people around you or on your own. And again, my disclaimer is there, which is also that I don't know you as individuals, I don't know my clients, so the information that I'm sharing with you today doesn't constitute medical advice um, at all. And um, if you are on a specialised diet that's been given to you by a nutritionist, a dietitian, a naturopath, a GP or a specialist, don't change anything that you're doing until you go back to them and have a chat. If there's something here that I talk about today that you really want to apply, just go back and check in with them that that suits the, um, the dietary protocol that you're on. Um, don't want to make you unwell. Um, so let's get into it and talk about the immune system, which is an incredibly complex mechanism. I think that sometimes we underestimate just how complex the immune system is. We all sort of talk about boosting the immune system or the, having good immunity, but we do, I think often we don't really understand what it is. So I could talk about the immune system for a number of hours, but I think I won't. I'll just, the step will probably cut me off at some point. Um, so really what the immune system does, it is, um, it is our defense mechanism against those things that it perceives as threats from outside the body. Um, things like bacteria. So bacteria includes things like salmonella that give us food poisoning that we might get from um, eggs that have gone slightly off, or campylobacter, which also um, causes food poisoning. And that comes from um, undercooked chicken. That's why it's so important to cook chicken properly. Um, or Legionella, um, uh, which causes Legionnaire's disease when you get um, air conditioners that haven't been um, cleaned properly and they cause a type of pneumonia. Um, the immune system fights viruses. You all know about one virus particularly. Um, and uh, so polio is caused by a virus, common colds, influenza, um, COVID-19 is caused by a virus. So it tries to fight off those. It tries to fight us fungi as well. So um, histoplasmosis that comes from bat and bird droppings. And it's something that's common for people who um, own birds. Um, you know, pigeons that they let go out and come back in, they can get sick from histoplasmosis. And aspergillus also um, can cause uh, lung uh, issues um, from rotting vegetation. 
other parasites like the ardea that can get into our water. I'm not sure if that's what happened in Melbourne, Steph, whether it was the ardea that they were concerned about or other untreated waste, which can include the ardea, but also microbial toxins. So sometimes the little bugs that get into us, um, they secrete other um, poisons, if you like, that can be problematic for us. And examples of that are um, things like E. coli and Staphylococcus. And the immune system, to be able to fight off those threats, needs a whole host of um, warriors, if you like, that go in and do things. And they include uh, various organs like the skin, um, the spleen and the thymus. It needs tissues like lymph nodes and um, other lymph tissue like adenoids and tonsils. Um, and also bone marrow coming to that as well. There's also specialised white blood cells that do some work for us. And then there's enzymes or other chemicals like um, stomach acid, hydrochloric acid that's in our stomach. Um, and various digestive enzymes that help us to break down um, uh, threats and also that help chemical reactions to take place in the body. And we've got, um, we've got two components to our immune system. We've got the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is relatively non-specific. It's not really looking for a threat to attack. It's just there saying, hang on a minute, let's keep all of these things away from us. So it kicks in pretty quickly and it includes things like our skin. So skin helps to keep things out. There's mucus in our respiratory tract. So in our nasal passages and our throat that help to uh, act as a barrier. We've got little hairs in our nasal passages that help to trap things before we can breathe them into our lungs. And uh, stomach acid is part of that first line of defense. Our tears and our sweat also have um, enzymes in them that try to break down any threats that come into the body or any foreign objects. So they, the, the, this particular part of the immune system, the innate immune system, we all have it and it just, it just does what it can do to, um, to, to stop those threats getting in and becoming a problem. So that's immediately on um, threat. The adaptive immune system is much more specific and it's basically our second line of defence, meaning that those threats have come in and invaded our first line of defence and now the body's gone, hang on a minute, I need to get rid of you. So this is what we might otherwise call um, our acquired immunity. It takes some time for this part of our immune system to activate, but once it's activated, um, because it's, the body's been exposed to a threat, um, Basically, the body, through the thymus, the spleen, the lymph, and the bone marrow, start to produce antibodies. And antibodies are proteins that work to fight against specific threats that come in. Let's hypothetically say um, you get a cold at the beginning of winter, caused by coronavirus, a different type of coronavirus than the one that's been a bit of a problem for us lately. Um, the body will send out these proteins to go out and attack that particular virus. And so you get better. You might have had a couple of days where you felt pretty off and pretty sick, and that's the immune system coming in and going, hang on, we've got to do some stuff here. We've got to get some inflammation going. So we're going to get um, swollen throat, swollen um, nasal passages to try and get everything from coming back into the body. I'm also going to produce mucus, mucus being something that's trying to trap things and expel it from the body. So you've had that first cold. Um, and then the next time um, you get well and you then you're around someone else who's got a cold and it's the same strain of coronavirus as the one that you've had. The immune system remembers what it did last time for that specific virus and it comes back in and it fights it again and it's much more effective and it takes much less time to kick in. So those antibodies stay in our body and they remember what's been going on. So the immune system, the adaptive immune system is quite specific and it targets those things that are non-self pathogens, which means it's a threat from outside the body. The body is able to recognize in most instances that anything that I've got in me any of my tissues, any of my cells are actually part of me and shouldn't be fought. So we hope that, fingers crossed, the uh, adaptive immune system actually works to recognise us um, rather than um, think of us as another type of threat. So hopefully that makes sense so far. I don't want to go through too much. As I said, we could do a whole lecture just on the immune system. Um, but why do we actually want to focus on the immune system. Why is it something that at winter time people suddenly go, oh, we've got to get some vitamin C and some zinc in and, and suddenly we're, we're all drinking chicken soup. Um, and why is it that it's become such an issue for us over this COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic that we've been in lockdown since March 23 to some extent in Australia? 
It's because when our immune system is functioning properly, when it's properly regulated, it can act quickly to move in and fight certain things like the coronavirus that causes uh, COVID-19, which is called SARS-CoV-2. Um, it recognises colds and flus. We're able to have little issues that might come of um, uh, contaminated food, if you like, and stop us from getting food poisoning. So food poisoning um, can be fatal. I don't think many people actually recognise that. Um, vomiting and diarrhoea can significantly dehydrate people, especially uh, where people are unwell or they're elderly or they're very young. So food poisoning is quite a serious illness. And so we want to avoid that where we can. Sometimes there's contaminated water, which is why Melbourne's boiling water at the moment. But, you know, several, I think it was about 12 or 15 years ago in Sydney, we had Giardia in our water supply. And um, so we want our body to be able to fight these things. One of the things I think that's really important, especially for um, polio survivors, is the concept of post-polio syndrome and the postulation that the polio virus is actually lying dormant in the body and um, understanding that that's probably in the spinal fluid. Um, other diseases also lay dormant. And I think if an immune system is working really effectively and functioning appropriately, what happens is we can keep those dormant viruses dormant. So we live with them, but we don't have to worry about them coming up and causing us problems. So for example, um, I have had cytomegalovirus, actually didn't even know I had it. So there's my immune system has gone out and, and done its work and kept me asymptomatic when I had cytomegalovirus, but I now have the antibodies for that. But I have cytomegalovirus now forever. So if I get run down or um, uh, I don't eat well or I don't exercise and I'm really stressed, what can happen is that gives um, an opportunity for that virus to raise its ugly head and come back. And it acts similarly to um, glandular fever. Um, Epstein-Barr virus causes glandular fever or mononucleosis. And I'm not sure if anyone's had it, and you don't need to tell me, but if anyone's had it, they'll know that um, glandular fever will come up and, and nip people in the butt every now and then because it's, um, it can be quite problematic. It's actually the, um, the, the virus that they suspect causes chronic fatigue syndrome um, because it just lays there and pops up. These viruses are opportunistic. And then, of course, the post-polio um, syndrome issue is, is a, a component of that whole concept of the disease is lying dormant in the body. So what you want is if it does pop up, you want shorter illnesses and you want better recovery times um, uh, if, if you do uh, contract a disease like any of these viruses or bacteria, or if you've got one of these diseases that lays dormant, you want to make sure that you are able to fight that appropriately. So it is really important. And I mean, if, if people are at work, obviously you don't want to be missing work. If you want to be around your grandkids, which I know is hard at the moment with this uh, physical distancing, which I prefer to call it than social distancing, um, you know, it, you want to be able to have um, access to people so that um, even outside of COVID-19, um, if you've got a robust immune system, having people come around and visit you shouldn't be a problem for you. But in fact, some people have such weak immune systems, like my mum um, had uh, emphysema and um, it, we just couldn't go near her because her immune system was shot um, anytime we felt like right, just even to a little sniffle. So it is really important to ensure that we've got this robust immune system. But can we actually boost it? There's a, you know, we we see a lot of um, we see a lot of discussion around boosting the immune system. In fact, even if you go and look, do a Google Scholar search, you'll see that there's a lot of material that's written about boosting the immune system. And I'm, and whilst I haven't written those papers, and um, and I'm, I'm, I don't have a PhD in the immune system, I'm not entirely sure that we can boost the immune system or that we particularly want to boost it. I think what we want, and, and I'll talk about this in terms of food in a minute, I think what we want is a properly regulated or modulated immune system. And by that I mean that we have an immune system that knows when to kick in and when to back off. It's like having an accelerator and brake system in your car. So what you want to do is when you want the immune system to work effectively and rapidly, it knows to put the accelerator on when you're exposed to say the common cold or a flu and it knows when to put the brake on 
you're feeling well, there's no, no threats around you, so I don't need to be over um, invested in trying to keep this body safe. The trouble is the way we live in 2020 doesn't necessarily equate to, um, uh, or doesn't, not equate, but doesn't allow us to have an immune system that's uh, properly regulated because we're under a lot of stress all the time. Um, people who are at work still will have access to emails coming at them. And I'm thinking about Michael and Steffi with 138 emails. Um, you know, not high workloads. Um, somebody said they might have to duck out in the middle of the talk today because they've got someone coming to the house. Um, those sorts of things where you're trying to do a couple of things at once actually cause your body to be under stress. And when you're under stress, you have stress hormones that are released and those stress hormones diminish your immune system. So I think what, what I'll talk about is how to use food and uh, lifestyle to help to modulate the immune system. Um, I think that people race out and they buy supplements like zinc and vitamin C, as I mentioned before, because they want a silver bullet. They want to have an immune system that functions immediately right here, right now, rather than thinking about what does this look like over my entire lifetime. So if you think about um, an, an, an inappropriately upregulated or super hyper boosted immune system, as an example, you might think of things like um, um, Graves' disease or Hashimoto's disease or lupus, any of those autoimmune diseases, which is where the immune system is so upregulated that it actually forgets that I am me and I don't need to fight my own tissues or cells. And that's what we actually see in autoimmune diseases. So that's why I don't think that boosting an immune system is always necessarily the right thing to do. And just as we were talking in, um, just before we started, we talked about having um, a very high number of deaths in Melbourne today, excuse me, because of COVID-19. And the interesting thing about the, um, the people that are dying um, through COVID-19 is when they go back and have a look at what's going on, they have very, very high levels of um, what we call cytokines, which are, are chemical messengers um, that are inflammatory and they help to regulate the immune system. And um, so what we're seeing is that these people who are dying in COVID-19 are actually dying from what we call a cytokine storm, which means they've got very, very high levels of these inflammatory um, immune markers causing hyperinflammation and that's what's causing the death more than the actual virus itself. So their body's kicked in so hard that um, it's not well modulated. Um, does that make sense, Stephen Michael? I can see Anne and Helen as well. So, um, and interestingly, and I'll talk about vitamin D in a minute, but interestingly, vitamin D is coming up as one of the biggest um, uh, factors nutritionally in COVID-19. And the reason for that is it, it's more a hormone than a vitamin, but it, it's one of its biggest roles, apart from bone health, is to modulate the immune system. It regulates when we put the accelerate on and when we put the brake on, which is a, an interesting thing. So they're looking at significant um, research around vitamin D so far. So how can we help the immune system? I mean, the best thing to do to, to, to help the immune system to do its job is to avoid the threat. You know, and they're the things that we're seeing all the time, you know, the physical distancing, washing hands, coughing and sneezing into your elbow, or if you do use a tissue, discard it and then um, sanitize your hands, those sorts of things. Food handling, making sure that we keep our, um, our food in the fridge um, and below five degrees if it's cold and above 60 degrees if we heat it. Um, making sure that our water is safe, you know, um, Steph's having that issue at the moment, um, but also to make sure that we eat really healthy foods, make lifestyle changes that might be, um, might be helpful for us in the long run. Vaccinations, I know, are, and I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but vaccinations in my nutrition world and um, that sort of natural therapies world is such a... Um, a fraught, politically angst-ridden um, concept. And some people are really anti-vaccinations. I'm not, I think that vaccinations absolutely have their place, but work well with um, uh, a good diet and lifestyle that supports the immune system in the long term. And one of the things I think that's important too is to make really healthy food choices where you can. And that means to have a load of variety because um, what we get when we have um, good variety and we're making more helpful choices and you know I don't think that I, I, I don't think that food is inherently good or inherently bad I don't think that if you have Maccas once a week 
you know, because um, you're taking your grandkids there, but the rest of your week is fantastic, healthy, whole foods. I don't think that Macca's is, is bad in that instance. It's where you start to do those sorts of things all day, every day. And, you know, some of my clients do eat McDonald's for breakfast and KFC for lunch and pizza for dinner. That's probably not helpful. But otherwise, inherently, there's no, there's no value for food. It is food. It's how we perceive it and how we use it. But having, having a broader and more varied diet means that we get more of the nutrients that actually support the immune system. So let's have a look at those. I'm not going to go through these in great depth, um, but uh, what I've got on the slide is slightly different to what I'm going to tell you, so I'm not going to read what's on the slide. Um, and I'm happy, Steph, to make these slides available to you in PDF format to send to everybody. Um, and I'll send that through after the talk. Um, the, so what I've got on the screen are the vitamins and, um, and where you get them. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why they're important in, in, in sort of relatively brief terms. So I'm not going down that really scientific road with this. But these nutrients that we look at um, work in concert. They don't work alone. So, you know, going off and buying vitamin C um, tablets and munching on some chewable vitamin C for a few weeks might ward off scurvy. Um, but it's not going to be helpful in terms of a really healthy, robust body and a healthy, robust immune system because the, the body needs all of these um, nutrients to be uh, in the body for it to function properly. One of the things about the stuff that you'll see on the screen is that overall it makes a relatively healthy diet, if you like, and a good diet helps to reduce inflammation. And inflammation um, has a role absolutely in... Um, uh, I've just seen a very long um, message come through, so I might leave that one to the end. Um, uh, a, a healthy diet actually helps to reduce inflammation, and, and inflammation is necessary in the immune system because we know it's got to, the body has to sometimes be inflamed to beat off a threat or to heal itself, but we need to be able to bring it back down. And I think sometimes the diets that we see people having with those high levels of junk food and sugar and alcohol actually increase inflammation but, and also decrease immunity. And what's really interesting that on average Australians, um, adult Australians, don't really get their, their recommended service of fruit and veggies. About half of us get the number of serves of um, fruit that we're recommended, which is two pieces of fruit a day, but only 7% of Australians eat their five serves of veggies every day. And less than 4% of our Australian kids get their recommended service of veggies every day, which might not seem like very much, but it's actually an increase from 2011-12, um, where less than 1% of our kids got their veggies and less than 4% of Australians got their veggies. So we, we're getting more veggies in, which is great. So vitamin C up there um, is a really potent antioxidant, and it actually helps to um, support immune defence by supporting a number of cellular functions that um, impact both the innate and adaptive immune system. And that includes supporting the function of white blood cells, which are the, those blood cells that go out to actually fight infection. Vitamin D, as I said, I'm not gonna go through this too much, but vitamin D is absolutely key as an immune regulator. That's the, the function that we're seeing um, is one of its, vitamin D has been a long forgotten um, uh, vitamin and for a long time in terms of bone health we looked at calcium only now we know that we need to take vitamin d with calcium but in terms of its support for the immune system um, its main role is that modulation of the immune system when does it start to kick in when does it back off um, zinc is also really important it um, helps to maintain our mucous membranes in our, in our respiratory tract helps to stabilize proteins as well and remember that those antibodies that come out to fight infections are actually proteins. So we get zinc helps those to build and be robust and be stable and to do the things that they need to do. Vitamin D also supports over 300 enzymatic reactions in the body, which include immune um, responses. And also is a, a key component to hydrochloric acid in the gut so that your body can actually make proper amounts of hydrochloric acid. Iron as well um, is really important. It actually um, does a lot of work around um, supporting the role of the innate immune system. So that one that is our first line of defense. Um, and a lot of people forget about iron in, um, uh, in, in the immune system. 
Um, what I want to talk about here just very briefly in terms of iron, the best way to get iron into the body is through meat, poultry and fish. Um, they have a type of iron that's much more regularly, uh, much more available to us. We can, we can absorb it much more readily. Green leafy vegetables, eggs and milk have a different type of iron called non-heme iron and it takes a lot more of that uh, iron to be consumed for us to get our daily intake of iron. So I'm a vegetarian. And I need to eat loads of leafy green vegetables and have a fair number of eggs to be able to get my iron levels in. Um, selenium is also important. Um, and Brazil nuts, you may be aware, is the place that most people think about when we talk about um, uh, selenium. It's really important for um, um, its antioxidant properties, but it also is incorporated into um, special proteins that um, basically help to regulate the cells and um, tissues that are part of our adaptive and innate immune systems. So they have, it has a role to play in terms of supporting uh, those tissues and cells that actually do stuff for us in the immune system. Um, folate um, enhances the um, production of immune cells and also helps to support protein synthesis. So if we've got um, plenty of green leafy vegetables in the diet, um, then we'll have a more robust immune system. Folate, by the way, is vitamin B9, um, and it's what people tend to think about when they're pregnant. I'm, I'm not sure that very many of us in the room would be thinking about getting pregnant, but um, it's the one that, yeah, that, that we focus on in terms of neural tube defects as well. Um, vitamin A, again, another long forgotten um, factor or player in the immune system. It actually supports skin integrity, so a very strong um, role to play in that innate immune system, so that first line of defence. It's also an antioxidant and it's an anti-inflammatory. And um, because of those uh, roles, it also helps to regulate the immune system as well. So it does a little bit of the same work that vitamin D does in terms of breaking and accelerating. Um, vitamin uh, B6, and often we don't think about B, B root vitamins in and of themselves. We think about them more as a complex, but vitamin B6 enhances the production of white blood cells and those antibodies to go in and fight infections as they come in. And vitamin B12 um, is also uh, a, a big player in, in um, white cell production as well. So again, those cells that go out to fight specific um, infections. I do want to mention here that um, vitamin B12 is only available to us as humans in, um, in animal products. So if you're like me, and oh, I, I, as, a, as a vegetarian, I eat uh, eggs and milk, but if I was vegan, for example, I get basically no vitamin B12. Whilst there's vitamin B12 in some vegan foods or plant-based foods, um, it's not actually bioavailable to us. So um, if you've got vegans in the family, um, have, get them to have a bit of a think about maybe um, supplementing with vitamin B12, it would be really important. Um, there's so many issues around B, vitamin B12 um, deficiencies, uh, not just relating to the immune system. So it's really worthwhile getting that in because otherwise you, they don't get it. Um, protein, um, proteins again are specific. When we think about, you know, we have a piece of steak and we go, here's some protein, fantastic. And so we, but we don't often think about what that protein does. When we eat a piece of steak or um, some eggs or some chicken or tofu, the body breaks down that protein into its constituent amino acids, so the, the building blocks of that protein, and the body rebuilds all of the proteins that it needs. So the body has about, that we know of, 250,000 different proteins in it, and they all have a specific role to play. And some of them are um, play the role of the antibodies, some of them um, act as hormones, some of them act as neurotransmitters, chemical messengers in the brain. There's a whole bunch of things that they do. So protein is really, really important. And of course, um, so in terms of the immune system, antibodies and enzymes are what we actually want protein for. But in terms of being polio survivors, one of the things that's really important in terms of um, your diet and having good quality lean protein is that you want to ward off sarcopenia, so you don't want to have muscle wastage. And so for 
people who are polio survivors, having probably a little bit more protein than is recommended by the, recommend, uh, by the, the National Health and Medical Research Council is probably um, something that you'd like to consider. Um, again, I don't know you, pending, pending your kidney health, kidney health is important in terms of protein consumption. You don't want to go too high if you've got kidneys that aren't functioning perfectly well. Um, but in terms of the usage of protein um, for people who have had polio, um, I'd be looking at having at least 1.5 grams to 2 grams per kilo of body weight per day. Um, so for men, the, the recommended dietary intake is 0.84 grams, so less than 1 gram a day. So I'm taking you up to um, almost double that. Um, uh, I was about to say something about that and I just lost it. Um, yeah, protein needs to be managed by the kidney. So if you've got a kidney issue, please go and have a chat to somebody about doing that. But ensuring that you get your protein um, content is, is important. The thing about protein is that you want to have a little bit with each meal and each snack. You don't want to have um, you know, a 500 gram piece of steak at the end of the night and think that that's how you're going to get your protein in because the body can only take in about 30 to 50 grams of protein at any given point in time. And when I talk about a 500 gram piece of steak, that's not 500 grams of protein, by the way, that is about um, 125 grams of protein. So steak has about 25 grams of protein um, per 100 grams. Um, chicken is about 22 grams of protein per 100 grams. Fish is similar. Eggs, one egg has six grams of protein in it. So, you know, you might have an 80 gram egg, but you're only going to get six grams of protein out of it. So when I talk about protein, I'm not talking about the food. I'm talking about the actual component of the food that is protein. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've got a couple of nods. Good. Okay, so that's all I want to say about food, but I, th I think I'm coming back to food in a minute, but I think that what's important is to recognise that this, I've only given you some of the nutrients that are really important in, um, in a robust immune system, but I think what you're hope I'm hoping what you're seeing by what's listed on the, the pages in front of you is that it's a fairly broad diet that we want to get to make sure that we get all of these nutrients in all the time. And interestingly, something like 70% uh, of Australians eat the exact same breakfast every single day. And about that same number eat the exact same lunch every single day. They may vary dinner. The problem with that is that you're getting the same nutrients over and over and over again. So what you want to do is broaden your um, nutrition as much as you can. Even if you have three or four breakfasts and three or four lunches that you like and rotate them so that you're having different food most days of the week so that your body can get um, different nutrition. The other thing that I'll say here is mostly I've talked about water soluble vitamins. So vitamin um, B group vitamins and vitamin C are water soluble. That means that we need to get them in most days of the week. Um, with vitamin C particularly, we'll flush that out very, very quickly. So it's important to keep in, uh, um, involving that in our meals so that we can get um, that replenished every single day. Um, fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K and, and um, uh, minerals like zinc and selenium, we don't need to get every day because they, they, they hold in the body for a little bit longer because they stay um, connected to fat. So they're not being just um, washed out very, very quickly. So um, movement and lifestyle. Uh, again, I've, I've called it movement here, but listed it as exercise because we know the studies are around exercise more than movement. Now, what we know is that um, exercise in and of itself is an anti-inflammatory and it promotes circulation. And what's good about that is it helps to promote circulation of white blood cells, part of the immune system. And this is where we have regular and moderate exercise and the recommendations about 150 minutes each week of moderate exercise, which is huff and puff exercise, which means that you can still talk, but you can't sing when you're exercising. I can't sing anyway, so I'm good. Um, the thing is that if you can't exercise, you know, some people can walk, some people can swim, some people are wheelchair bound and can't do that. 
So whatever movement you can do, whether you've got a physio or an exercise physiologist or, or someone else who's working with you, whatever you can do, if, you, if you've got, um, I was going to pick up my drink bottle, my, my glass of water, then it would have been a disaster. But if you can go to your can, your fridge or, or um, cupboard and get some tins of tomatoes and just do some weights or do something that's easy every single day that helps to get the circulation going. Um, so we know that the other thing about exercise is that it gives us um, enhanced mood because we get the release of endorphins. And that's any movement. So just doing as much as you can and increase as tolerated. So I'm not suggesting that you all decide to go out and, and run or wheel a, a, a marathon. Whatever you can tolerate, just little bits every day. Trying to manage stress would be really important. What we see when people are really stressed, we get this release of those pro-inflammatory cytokines. And as I said, you know, inflammation is a good thing over a short period, but um, long-term chronic systemic stress gives us strong chronic systemic inflammation which actually um, diminishes our immune system and, and increases our risk for developing um, other chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and fatty liver and so forth the other thing about chronic stress and this may be um, um, interesting to you that the long-term chronic stress actually can activate latent viruses so really managing your stress will help to keep, um, won't abs be an absolute guarantee, but will help to keep polio virus at, you know, um, in, in its dormancy if we can. So really important to just do some deep breathing or some meditation, which we know um, helps to improve the immune function and to, to diminish um, inflammatory cytokines and to calm us down, calm the nervous system down. So a little bit of stress management, a little bit of meditation, even going in having a massage where you can have a little doze off while somebody's um, massaging you would be great. And trying to get some sleep in too. I think um, sleep is really um, underestimated when it comes to its capacity to support good health, but it can actually support um, the adaptive immune response. And we know that smoking and um, alcohol absolutely disrupts and weakens our immune system. Smoking also disrupts the um, uh, respiratory tracts and mucous membranes so really worthwhile getting rid of it. Nicotine in and of itself is known to be an immunosuppressant um, so um, if you smoke maybe try and quit or cut down and same with alcohol. Um, alcohol actually affects the innate immune system as well um, not just the um, adaptive immune system so um, what we get again is these pro-inflammatory responses. Weight management too. If you're a little bit overweight going into later life, you know, sort of with a BMI of about 26, the, the, the thinking around that is not necessarily um, um, problematic. Um, but, uh, you know, being significantly overweight can be a problem because fat cells or fat tissue actually secrete inflammatory markers that tell the body to constantly be inflamed. So we know that uh, being overweight or obese actually does diminish again the immune system. So really important that you um, um, have a look and think about what you're doing in terms of your food and, and your capacity to exercise to try and uh, manage your weight over time. And so I guess when it comes to the question about whether or not we should use food or supplements, and of course I supplement as a nutritionist, but I don't um, do it as my first port of call. Wherever I can, I try to get um, food in to people um, and change the quality of their food up so that it's um, uh, that their, their immune system is working because they're being fueled properly all the time. I think where we rely on supplements, we have to think about why why we're having that reliance on supplements. What's our diet doing that's not particularly helpful? So if you can go, you know, uh, what I'm happy to also send to Steph is um, uh, a link to the Australian Dietary Guidelines just so people can see what serving sizes look like and um, how, not, what numbers of serves of fruits and veggies, uh, protein, and et cetera, that people can get in. With my disclaimer that that's probably not quite enough protein for people with polio. Um, so going on, we've talked about um, we've talked about protein already that's on there. Um, women, it's recommended that we have five serves of veggies a day and two serves of fruit. Men, sorry, you have to eat more veggies. So six serves of veggies and two serves of fruit. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that that does is give us um, greater capacity to obtain all of those nutrients that we're talking about before. So vitamin C particularly and beta-carotene is a pro-vitamin A 
come in through fruits and veggies. The other good thing about um, fruits and veggies is that they provide really high levels of fibre in the diet, so it keeps our gut nice and healthy and um, keeps our bowels nice and healthy, but the gut actually plays a significant role in the support of our immune system as well. And probably um, I've read that so up to 70% of our immune system is regulated by what goes on in our gut, so having a healthy gut is really important. And part of that is actually making sure that we get plenty of water in. Um, now, we've heard that have eight, eight glasses of water or two litres of water every single day. Where does that come from? It actually comes from the, the thought that we need to have about 30 mils per kilo of body weight per day. So if you're a 60 kilogram woman, you need to get in about 1.8 um, litres of water a day. If you're an 80 kilogram man, you need to have somebody help me, um, 2.4 litres of water every single day. Um, if you don't do that, um, the body will actually absorb um, water back out from your poo through your large bowel and recycle it. Not great. And it can lead to constipation, which is also not fantastic for a, a healthy bowel which, and, and gut, which will end up diminishing your immune system a little bit. So um, that was my breakfast one day. So I've got some fat on there. I've got protein. I've got the, the white stuff on the bottom is actually a, a Greek, uh, it was a yogurt that I made into a lovna with garlic through it and got some good homemade um, sourdough there. So, you know, carbohydrates aren't evil either. So what I've got here is just a couple of things to do to think about um, um, eating well. And, uh, you know, as I said, these things shouldn't be hard, shouldn't have to be hard for you. Have, um, make some time to contemplate what you might have for lunch um, today or dinner tonight, rather than suddenly getting to five o'clock and thinking, what, what am I gonna make? I have no idea. Um, so come back and, um, and have a bit of a think. Prioritize this. You are absolutely worthy of, of prioritizing good food um, because it's about prioritizing yourself and looking after you. So also include some healthy convenience foods. I think that's the other thing is that processed foods actually um, are high in poor quality fats, they're high in salt, they're high in sugar, which don't support the immune system. Um, but it doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't have things that are convenient for us to eat. And they can be really good quality muesli bars, and there are a couple of those on the market that I can talk about offline in terms of brand names. Um, there's uh, there's um, having some boiled eggs in the fridge are convenient. Having some soups, there are some fantastic soups available um, in the supermarkets these days that really will make life easy for you on those days that you just don't want to cook. And doing things like having a barbecue chook, there's nothing wrong with a barbecue chicken. They are just on a rotisserie, they're basted in their own fat, which mostly drops off, and so they're a lean and good quality protein for you to have. Wherever you can, try and have, as I said, that little bit um, of protein with each meal and snack. So try and avoid carbohydrate only snacks, which might be something that you would do if you have a cup of tea at, um, in the morning, around about you know an hour ago, you might have had a cup of tea. Instead of going and getting a couple of biscuits with it, maybe get a little handful of nuts so you've got some good fibre and some good fats in there and some protein as well. So just try and keep those with you. And if you find you're out and about and you've been out with someone for a day, uh, maybe take some nuts or one of those muesli bars that we were talking about in your, in your bag so that you can have those rather than go and, and have, um, you know, trying desperately to find the best available option and you end up having a donut. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the occasional donut, but you know, if you've got things available for you, it'll make it easy to make healthier choices. And I think the other thing is to try and remember that good nutrition doesn't need to be um, it doesn't need to be um, difficult. We don't. I think MasterChef and My Kitchen Rules and all of those cooking shows have made it so awkward for us because we think we need robust flavors and we need to do all these amazing um, things. Um, every single day to, to, to be, you know, to make it look like we've done some reasonable cooking. The truth is that having a piece of grilled fish in a salad is absolutely perfectly fine. And keeping things simple means that it's easier for you to get some good, um, good options in. And there's a message there that as a vegetarian for 50 years, I've been having dry roasted nuts and dates for morning tea. Fantastic. Um, I actually quite like a date, one of those medjool dates, you de seed it and put a teaspoon of 100% peanut butter or nut butter in it, and it's very unctuous and yummy, a great dessert for, um, after dinner with a cup of peppermint tea. Um, so here are just some simple things, you know, um, uh, you know, if you're drinking a lot of coffee, maybe, or, or caffeinated tea, maybe have a bit of a think about going over to herbal teas, 
Um, if you're drinking soft drinks, even if they're diet soft drinks, move away from those and go over to plain water or soda water. Soda stream is fantastic for that. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but you know, you can see there that you can still have some fun. Like we like to make homemade burgers and pizzas at home, but my pizzas I make on um, a Lebanese bread, so a big pitta rather than that hot, you know, high fat um, meal that you might get, say, from some of the takeaway places. Um, you know, and choosing, having the occasional ice cream, but sometimes having plain fruit and yogurt. My dad had surgery last week. My dad's 85 and I went to his place and all he had in the freezer, or you know, he had hardly any food in his fridge because I hadn't been down there to fill it up. And he had bunches of ice cream in the freezer. So I went and got him some tubs of um, uh, fruit, individual serves of um, stewed fruit, and a thing of yogurt, not yogurt, custard. And that at least gives him much more fiber, much more nutrition, it gives him calcium, it gives him some protein in the yogurt. So it's, it's you know, as I said, these switches don't have to be, you know, the superfoods that you hear about all the time and, and we maybe don't understand. But going back to some of those simple foods that you've always, um, uh, or that you, you grew up with would be a really helpful thing to do. So hopefully there's some options on there that make a little bit of sense. And here's some um, extra snacks as well, just to make sure that uh, that you've, you've got those that capacity to go and get something quickly and easily without making this hard for yourself. By the way, a boiled egg in a lettuce leaf is delicious. You get the creaminess of the egg and you get the crunch of the lettuce leaf, which is amazing. Um, uh, and down the bottom, if you're not accustomed to the chia puddings, go and try one because they're delicious chia seeds and have, um, you can make some with some milk and yogurt, put in a little bit of um, drizzle of honey or maple syrup on there. Um, and it sets, it's sort of the, 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 the chia seeds will soak up the water and, you, and you'll get fantastic soluble fiber for your gut and good protein in the chia seeds. And it becomes a little pudding, kind of like a, uh, maybe like a sago pudding or a rice pudding, that sort of texture. And edamame are the um, soybeans that are, um, you can buy frozen now, so you just need to steam them up or boil them, stick them in the microwave, tiny bit of salt, and then you've got an, an amazing snack that has high levels of protein in it as well, as well as other nutrition. And some fruit and nut balls. And if people want some recipes for fruit and nut balls, I'm also happy to send those um, to Steph. So look, I've taken about an hour and um, that's that's it from me because I don't want to go too hard over this stuff because I wanted to give you some things to think about. Um, but I'm happy to open up to questions. Um, 